Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Audrey Hassan, patient liaison for the MDS Foundation, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. Thank you to Bristol Myers Squibb, Jazz, Novartis, and Taiho for supporting this webinar program. Please note that this is a pre recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. The live questions with answers opportunities for all participants are included at the end of this presentation. Today's presenter is Sarah Tinsley, an advanced practice registered nurse specializing in providing care to patients diagnosed with hematologic malignancies at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. Nurse Tinsley has been practicing as a hematology nurse practitioner at Moffitt for 30 years, 11 years in blood and marrow transplant, two years in patient triage, and the past 17 years in malignant hematology. She is a member of the Leukemia Research Team and specializes in the care of patients with acute myeloid leukemia, myelodysplastic syndromes, aplastic anemia, and other bone marrow failure syndromes. Sarah earned her PhD, master's degree, and bachelor's degree from the University of South Florida, and she's board certified as an advanced oncology nurse by the Oncology Nursing Certification Corporation. Sarah is also a co-investigator on multiple clinical trials within the Department of Malignant Hematology. She is also working on her research interest on the evaluation and improvement of quality of life in older patients diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and high-risk myelodysplastic syndromes. She received an American Cancer Society doctoral degree in nursing scholarship and is working on a decision-making model focused on quality of life with different treatment intensities sponsored by the National Institute of Health. Sarah also works as a courtesy clinical instructor in the College of Nursing at the University of South Florida and regularly lectures in the oncology program. She is also a member of the MDS Foundation Nurse Leadership Board and leads many of the Foundation's patient and family educational meetings. With that said, it is my pleasure to introduce Sarah Tinsley. Hi, I'm Sarah Tinsley Vance. I'm a nurse practitioner and scientist, nurse scientist at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. Welcome to this presentation. I'm very excited to be here and I welcome all of you. This presentation is really focused on becoming a partner in your care. In order for your medical team and nursing team to take the best care of you, we need to know a little bit about you and we want to encourage you to become really a partner in your care. And as a nurse, we really value uh, educating patients about being a part of their care, like understanding the disease and knowing what questions to ask your medical team. This is based on the building blocks of hope and that is on the MDS Foundation's website. There's an app that goes along with this that I can show you. And it's presented to you from the International, International Nursing Leadership Board. Uh, so with that, let's get started. So like I said, we're very glad you're here. We want to help you learn more about living with MDS, living. Um, and we know that education really can empower you. And the more you understand your disease, the better you can manage your health. The other thing I really like to emphasize is really having those questions for your medical team so that they can know what's really important to you and go over those points that you don't quite understand and help us to learn what's most important to you so that we can be involved in this shared decision-making with you and your caregivers and your family and friends, whoever's involved uh, with your journey with MDS, really helping support you through this and help you advocate for yourself. So one of the things that's important, um, just like when we say colors, there's multiple different colors. MDS is like that. There's myelodysplastic syndromes and they each have different, um, different flavors or different colors of MDS or different subtypes. 
that are associated with a score. And that's important to know because it tells you what to anticipate, like as far as your prognosis, as far as transfusions, type of problems that you're gonna experience as you go through this journey with myelodysplastic syndrome. So really understanding your diagnosis helps you know what type of treatments are most appropriate for you and which clinical trials you would best be fitted for. And we'll go over like how you look for clinical trials too, if you've already received all of the standard of care options. And we'll show you how to take advantage of the resources and technology that's available to you. Um, my father is 75, he lives with us. And when he first started living with us, he really didn't understand how to use his cell phone. And uh, with a lot of coaching or not actually that much coaching, but with constant reinforcement and using his iPad now, uh, he's very, uh, he can navigate through his, uh, these technologically advanced devices and get really uh, a good experience. It's like, he says it's like watching TV, but I can tailor it to what I like the most. And so hopefully you'll get that out of this presentation. And then we really want to focus on staying well. And again, that I can't overemphasize how communication with your healthcare team and knowing what's mo most important to you and your family. So understanding your MDS. So you want to know what your IPSSR score is. And that stands for International Prognostic Scoring System. And it was uh, revised. So we're using the revised version of it now. And that really helps you to know more about your prognosis and you know which treatment options fit you the best and what your future looks like. On the right here, it tells you how to calculate your IPSS revised score. So you need to have your blood work with you and your bone marrow biopsy report and also those cytogenetics. And that is where they tell you whether your chromosomes are XX if you're a female or XY. And there's a certain number of dividing cells that they count and those are called metaphases. Um, and that will go into your cytogenetic risk category at the very bottom there. Um, and you can get your healthcare team really to, to show you those results and help you calculate your score. So you need to know what your hemoglobin is, and that comes from your CBC. Um, your neutrophil count, you have to have the differential of your CBC. And the neutrophils are a subcomponent or a subtype of white blood cell that's very important in helping you know what your risk for an infectious problem is. And then you need to know what your platelets are and the bone marrow blast that comes directly from your pathology report. And then once you know your cytogenetic risk category, then you can calculate your IPSS revised. If you had a solid tumor, this would be like your stage of disease. You've heard um, patients with breast cancer or maybe prostate cancer say that they have stage two or stage four, stage four being if their cancer moved to other places. We don't really talk about it that way. When you have myelodysplastic syndromes, we talk about your IPSSR because your bone marrow is throughout your body. So it's already in more than one place. So that's why we don't use the traditional staging system that's used for solid tumors. And then under categories and scores, you can see once you add all of these numbers up, if you have very low risk disease, that would be a 1.5 or less. Low is one greater than 1.5 to three. And then you can go down the list there. Very high is more akin to like an advanced stage disease if you were comparing it to solid tumors. And you'll see at the bottom again, emphasizing knowing your subtype. And so within, you have your IPSSR score, but you also have a subtype that's based on the morphology or the size and shape of the cells. And those blasts, the more blasts you have, the more similar your disease is to leukemia, 
with a cut point for evolving into acute myelogenous leukemia set at 20% or greater. So the higher the blast percentage, um, the worse the disease or the, the more limited um, the time span is um, prognosticated to be, or um, you know, if you're talking about survival, and the higher the score, then the more the need is for starting treatment. These are some resources that are on the MDS Foundation website. And you can see this is under for visitors and patients across the top in that blue bar. You'll see about us, which tells you about the MDS Foundation, understanding MDS for healthcare professionals. And then you want to go under for visitors and patients. And then you can see all of the resources that are listed there. Um, patient and caregiver resources, the building blocks of hope. There's a message board. There's um, patient and caregiver forums. And so you can work your way through those. You'll also see that there is an app at the bottom of the middle column called the MDS Manager app. And that is a really useful resource if you're using your iPhone uh, for really tracking your journey with myelodysplastic syndrome. And then there are also these U and MDS videos that you can access um, at the bottom there. Well, right in the middle, um, you have the patient stories. So you can hear firsthand experiences from other patients about their journey, about them living with myelodysplastic syndromes. And then there are also learning modules you'll see right in the middle there, understanding myelodysplastic syndromes, the diagnosis, and then the third one is the management and treatment of MDS. And then how does blood and marrow transplant fit in in patients with myelodysplastic syndromes? So really quite a few resources for you to explore on your own time and then to jot down questions that you may have that you heard about in the videos, or you can also reach out to the MDS Foundation and see if you can get someone to talk to you more. Um, and we're happy to help you as you go through this journey. This is the MDS Manager mobile app that I was referring to. It's for smartphone and tablets that are Apple and Android. In this MDS Manager app, you have your MDS profile. There's the IPSS revised score. It'll, it will walk you through that scoring system. You can look at your bone marrow results and also look at the molecular profile, which we haven't really talked about that. They're doing, we are doing now these next generation sequencing myeloid mutation profile that we're adding along with those cytogenetics or chromosomal abnormalities to better inform us about what your prognosis is and when you need treatment. And really, is this something that could have been inherited? We're learning more and more about that. And then you can share that with other family members so they can be screened if it's something that could be inherited. It helps you track your labs. Something that's really very important is tracking your transfusion history to see how that's changing over time. And generally we think that the more transfusions you're needing, that that's really indicating that your, that your disease could be changing. And that's how we evaluate response to certain treatments as to whether or not you're having a decrease in your transfusion requirements or an increase. And that can really signal your healthcare team to know when it's better, uh, when it's time to, to stop that treatment and move to another treatment. There's also a symptom tracker, which I'm a quality of life researcher, and that's really important to me. Um, we found from studies that when we ask doctors questions or healthcare members questions, such as nurse practitioners and PAs, and then we ask the patient that the patients often rate their symptoms um, much more uh, severe and impacting them than we do because we don't really know 
how they're impacting their day-to-day activities. And sometimes I think patients, at least in our clinic, sometimes get tired of waiting. And so they say they're fine when really, if we were to look at a symptom tracker, we would be able to appreciate that they're having a lot of symptoms that we could potentially help them with in this journey with myelodysplastic syndromes. There's also a medication and reminder um, capabilities. You can download those reports and take them to your doctor. They're in printable format. You can also upload reports to keep track of like your bone marrow biopsies and sync with your calendar to help manage your appointments, to manage your appointments. You can use all or just some of the uh, features in the MDS Manager app. And then there's also the MDS Foundation app. So another app that can really help you. And this provides patients, caregivers, and other healthcare providers with the quick access to those important services that the MDS Foundation provides. Um, You can find MDS centers of excellence on there and see how close they are to you. And you can see about other MDS patient forms and events that you can participate on and there's other online resources available to you. And this is what it looks like there in the middle on the left, a nice blue um, framing around it. It's one of my favorite colors. And then if you need to participate in a clinical trial, there is general uh, clinical trial information. Audrey is very good about keeping that updated You can see if you know your subtype and what your IPSS revised score are, then you can look through these clinical trials and see if there's one near you that best fits um, where you are in your treatment. Um, And so that's really important because you have access to to treatments that aren't FDA approved yet. Um, So that's, that's really important that you have access to that. Uh, My quality of life studies are also on there. Um, Right now, they're open to patients with AML and not MDS. And your healthcare provider is also a good person to talk to about clinical trials that may be available at your uh, treating facility or a um, clinical trial that's close to where you live. And clinicaltrials.gov, if you're not using the MDS Foundation's website, that's a good place that you can go um, to see if there are clinical trials close to where you live and you know what's, what's available out there. You can also look and see what some of the results are if they've been posted yet. So you can see how far along they are in this research with that particular agent. One of the key things, um, with myelodysplastic syndromes is avoiding infections. And with this uh, COVID pandemic, I think we're all better in tune to infections and how they're transmitted. We all know now by this time that washing your hands is critical to stopping the spread of germs. But one of the other things that's particularly important for patients with hematologic disorders is monitoring your blood counts. You want to, if you can, get a copy of your complete blood cell count with differential. And then you want to look at the neutrophils. And again, that's a subtype of, a, it's a type of white blood cell. And if that neutrophil count is less than 500, then that's considered severely neutropenic and greatly increases your risk of getting an infection If you don't know how to find that on your lab work, I would encourage you to discuss that with your medical provider. Also, I think this is obvious at this point in our, uh, in the world's journey with the COVID-19 pandemic is avoiding people who are obviously ill. We encourage all of our patients to wear their masks when they're out in public, even if it's not something that's mandated, that that's a, a barrier, an additional barrier between them and potential people who have infections. You might recall that early in the pandemic, they noted that uh, other viral infections were decreasing. And I think that's attributed to good hand washing and people wearing masks and avoiding people with infections. You wanna, again, wash your hands often and then talk to your 
a healthcare provider about symptoms that need attention. You know, if you have a sore that's red and oozing, that's a definite sign of infection. And uh, new symptoms like a cough, increased shortness of breath, sinus congestion, urinary pressure or urgency, frequency, those are signs of urinary infections. And of course, uh, if you have a fever, we talk about a neutropenic fever as a temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit that lasts for more than an hour. So you have it on more than one occasion and then promptly reporting that to your healthcare team uh, or going to an emergency room if you can't get a hold of them if your neutrophil count is less than 500. Another important piece that's on this slide on the right-hand side is really getting your immunizations, your COVID vaccinations, getting a flu shot every year, and the pneumonia vaccines. That There are two pneumococcal vaccines that are recommended for adults, and that's the 13-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and also the 23-valent pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. And so I encourage you really to talk with your healthcare provider about which vaccines you should receive and the CDC recommendations uh, for ages 65 years or greater, or patients who are immune compromised, which includes many of our patients with myelodysplastic syndromes. For us, we really don't recommend live vaccines for immunocompromised patients, uh, but we do have a new shingles vaccine that's uh, not a live vaccine that we are encouraging our patients to receive. So really talk to your healthcare provider. They know you better than I know you since I don't know many of you. I know some of you, um, but talk to, to your healthcare provider because they know uh, where you are in this journey and what would be most appropriate for you. I hope you're still with me. I know it's a lot of information. Um, and this is getting back to the core of a really MDS, uh, tracking your blood counts and getting your bone marrow biopsy reports. If you have both of those, you can really learn a lot about your disease. So we talked about the neutropenia, and that is when you have too few neutrophils. And again, that's a type of white blood cell. If you don't get a differential with your CBC, you won't be able to see that. You'll just see WBC. So it's critical that your CBC has a differential in it because the differential tells you what type of white blood cells that you have um, coming out of your bone marrow. So the neutrophils are when you have too, too few neutrophils. And when that happens, that increases your risk of bacterial infections, such as your skin. A lot of times those are called cellulitis. The sinuses are a common place, the lungs and the urinary tract. And you know, sometimes older people don't get fever. So you may really need to rely on symptoms outside of a fever cough, new weakness. Also, one of the signs of a serious infection is if someone has a change in their fermentation, if they're not acting normal, if, they see, if a person seems a little confused and they never had that before, that can be one of the signs of a serious infection. It can also go along with severe anemia. So your caregivers know you, uh, and if they just if, the, if you detect, if you're a caregiver and you detect a big change in the person you're supporting, please communicate that with your uh, treating team. And then you'll see what a normal breakdown is in the differential right in the middle. WBC stands for white blood cell. The normal is between four and 11. There's a little bit of variance depending on which lab you have that drawn at, and then you can see what the normal neutrophil count should be, 2.5 to 7.5 thousand, and it should be 50 to 70% of the total white blood cell count. Lymphocytes are next. They should be the next most common. You can see the numbers for those, 1.5 to 3.5, and then monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. 
And the absolute neutrophil count is the total WBCs times the percentage of neutrophils. And I used to have to calculate this, but many times now our labs just tell you what the neutrophil count is, at least on our labs, and then down below it, what percentage that is. And then looking at your other blood counts, anemia is really the most common cytopenia or low blood count that we see in patients with MDS. And that's when you have too few red blood cells that really carry your hemoglobin and supply oxygen to your tissue. As I said, it's the most common blood disorder or uh, cytopenia or low blood count with MDS patients. Fatigue is, goes along with anemia. Um, shortness of breath that's increasing, or maybe you notice that you're usually very active and that now when you try to do very much, you get short of breath or your legs feel light or you feel, you just don't feel right or you're sweating. Um, those can be signs of anemia also. If when you're doing your normal activities that didn't give you symptoms and suddenly you're developing symptoms, headaches go along with it a faster heart rate because your body's trying to compensate and get that oxygen to your tissues. So one of the ways it does that is increases that heart rate. You can see the normal values there in the middle. For a male, it's 14 to 18 grams per deciliter. And for a female, it's 12 to 16. And then another component of that or another way of looking at that is looking at the hematocrit. And you can see that that's higher for men as well in comparison to women. Thrombocytopenia, the big word, um, it's low platelets. So when you have too few platelets and our platelets are integral for creating that plug and creating a, a blockage when someone's bleeding. So when you have too few platelets, uh, you don't have enough to really control your bleeding well but that depends on how low the platelet count is. Um, platelets are normally 150 to 400,000. And so when you get lower than that, it's technically caused, called thrombocytopenia. We, however, know that you can still do pretty well with a lower than normal platelet count. It gets critically low when it's 10,000 or less, we would transfuse you with platelets at our institution. Uh, some places use 20,000. If you're actively bleeding and you're less than 50,000, we would give you a transfusion here of platelets. So what can you do to stay healthy? Again, being part of that team and telling uh, the doctor and the nurse practitioner or the PA or the nurse that you're seeing or the social worker you're talking to how much it's really impacting your ability to do the things that you enjoy in life. And we all have different things that we value. And so depending on what that is for you, we wouldn't know unless you shared that with us. Like, I'm so tired that I can't even interact with, with people who call me. But that's pretty, that's really impacting your, your ability to, to continue your relationships. And that really tells us at a deeper level than just saying, I feel lousy. You know, it gets very, it's more granular, it's more descriptive. Um, so ask for help when you need it. I try to encourage my patients to plan the things they enjoy during the time of day when they have the most energy and then cut themselves some slack and take a nap if they need to or get other people to help them out. Maybe you can't do everything that you used to do. And that's when other people really have the opportunity to show you how much they care for you. Um, so ask for help when needed. Adjust your lifestyle. Adjust the way you're thinking too. Try to be more positive. It's a lot easier said than done, but really reframing how you adapt to your illness instead of look how much it's taking away from me. Like, look how much I can still do. Look how much I've learned that people really care about me. And then learn how to manage and report your symptoms. Uh, we'll go over that with recommendations on keeping your healthcare team involved and 
and getting the most out of your visits that you can and being really an active participant and building hope for yourself and for your caregiving team. This is a continuation of that. Um, lifestyle changes play a really important role in your overall physical and mental health. It can help manage or lessen the side effects of treatment. And you wanna keep your immune system as strong as possible to aid in your fight against MDS or other illnesses. One of my mentors or my primary mentor right now is doing research in breast cancer patients, looking at ways she can improve their level of fatigue. And she has an intervention called mindfulness-based stress reduction. You can uh, Google that or look on YouTube. And it's a way of uh, training your brain really to relax. And she followed um, people's immune system cells and actually found that if people had decreased fatigue and were able to really participate enough in this intervention, that it improved their immune system function. So that's like, that was really very impactful for me, the ability of retraining your mind to help your immune system. It also can improve uh, your emotional outlook with your diagnosis and treatment. You don't feel so much like a victim and you just have to deal with this, but take an active part in your treatment. And fitness really is a key factor when we look at patients' eligibility to continue treatment or even participate in a clinical trial. I encourage exercise at whatever level a person can um, participate in, even chair exercises. Um, you can ask for a referral to a physical therapist or trainer. Physical therapists do an amazing job these days. They evaluate you and then they come up with a treatment recommendation or an intervention. And you can see there on the right, there's a person in a wheelchair that's using resistance bands to try to keep their muscles moving. Because we all know if you don't use it, you lose it. And especially as we get older, we use, we lose uh, our ability, we lose muscle tissue, and we also uh, become stiffer as we age if we're not moving those muscles and joints and uh, you know keep them moving. Strength training is an option and even light cardio such as walking can add benefit. I've had some patients that I recommended uh, who had like severe arthritis and some shortness of breath uh, to walk like in a swimming pool because that gives them some resistance if they have a pool at their house, but also to have another person there if they get too tired so that they're safe. Getting enough rest, uh, you can monitor that now with our, our little special devices on Fitbits and uh, Apple Health, where you can see how much deep sleep you get and how much sleep you get and how many times you wake up during the night, that all factors in. And also your sleeping conditions, a room that is quiet and cool and without a lot of noise so that you can get a full night's rest, eating light before you go to bed. You don't want uh, to be on your iPad for hours before you go to bed. And also getting into a regular habit helps trigger your body to know that you're winding down and getting ready to go to sleep. And then your nutrition, uh, you wanna stay well hydrated. One of the ways that I encourage people is really putting a certain number of bottles in the refrigerator and when they're all gone, when you're, they're gone or empty, you know you met your goal. You can also track your water intake through um, these little Fitbit apps. It has, you know, you can mark the little button to say how many glasses of water you've had in a day. That will definitely help with your fatigue. A balanced diet, you want to eat a variety of foods and not pro highly processed and sugary foods uh, or excessive preservatives. And that has an impact on us. You want to limit or exclude your alcohol intake if you can. You want to get enough calories and protein, uh, avoid fat diets, 
and ask about supplements, some of those could interfere with your treatments. So you really want to know whether that's a safe supplement for you to take. Some of them also can lower your blood counts. Really, um, you want to take an accurate list of all of your appointments of all of your medications and all of your supplements that you're taking and ask if there's any dietary restrictions based on your blood count. We also know that if your platelets are less than 50,000, that can increase your um, risk of bleeding. So you wanna to talk to your healthcare provider about their specific recommendations, especially for any surgical procedures that are coming up or if you um, have a stent in your heart and you need to stay on some type of treatment to keep your stents open, you wanna really have a good discussion with your healthcare team, include your uh, cardiologist and your oncologist in this discussion about what's a, a safe platelet count for you to remain on the medication that keeps your stent from clotting off. And then we talked about this previously, but you wanna record and track those blood counts over time. When you're on a new treatment, it's important to track those for the first eight weeks of treatment and then if they're very stable, you can track them intermittently. If someone's very stable, they may only need to be uh, checked maybe once every month or once every three months. Um, we do actually have, I have patients I've followed that have been very stable for years. So uh, it's not all great changes. Uh, you wanna avoid aspirin or aspirin contain medications with those platelets less than 50,000. And then you see uh, those other medications I was talking about for stents and for people who have a risk of a clot, such as someone with atrial fibrillation, because they're typically on blood thinners. So really your healthcare team that you're involved with is the best person to advise you on that. But I just wanna help make you aware that when you're on aspirin or Coumadin or Xarelto and you have a lower than normal platelet count, that does increase your risk of bleeding. So help us monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding and talk to us about it. And if there's a fall when your platelets are low, and especially if you're on a blood thinner too, you wanna get evaluated after you fall to make sure you don't have bleeding in a place that you can't see it, such as if you fell and hit your head you want that to be checked out thoroughly. There are some quick tips that are practical tools to help you manage your common symptoms or problems that are on the MDS Manager app. And those can also be found on the MDS Foundation webpage and the Building Blocks of Hope. And you wanna stay connected with your primary care provider not just seeing your oncologist all the time or your hematologist oncologist and managing all of your diagnosis is really diagnoses is necessary to stay well. Um, I have patients that I see frequently, but I don't check them for prostate cancer or breast cancer. So you still need your primary care provider involved in your care. Uh, there are just certain things that we focus on if we're treating you for MDS. So you, you really want that whole group of people, healthcare providers that can manage all aspects of your care. I know that previously we weren't all subspecialized and one person took care of it all, but now unfortunately or, uh, we have specialized knowledge. So there's a benefit to that, but it, it does put more burden on patients and and seeing more than one provider to manage their overall health. Um, you do want to keep a current list of those providers, their contact information, the faxes and phone numbers, and you want to share the list with all of your providers so they can communicate and collaborate to, to keep you as healthy as possible. So what can you do? Really help be your own advocate and teach us about what's most important to you ask questions, have these honest, open discussions with your healthcare team, make your wishes clear, help us know you better so that we can really tailor your care to what's most important to you and what your goals are when you're getting treatment. 
And you want to prepare for each visit, make the most of your visit. And one of the ways you can do this is setting an agenda. Uh, what do I want to get out of this visit? Write down the top three things that you want to discuss. And then focusing on your agenda will help make the most of your time with your healthcare team. And then bring your caregivers, your personal support team uh, to those visits so that they can be an extra set of ears. There's also a feature on iPhones and Androids, I believe. I know for sure it's on the iPhones that it's a, a recorder so that if your care team can't accompany you, that you could record that. Of course, you need to ask permission and let us know that you're recording us, but that's one way that you can replay it and then go over the primary points that were mentioned during that visit. And then you also wanna bring uh, the most up-to-date information on your medication and supplement list, uh, also vitamins and herbs that you're taking, and use the symptom tracker in the NDS manager or write down your most troubling symptoms and when they occur and what makes them better, what makes them worse. And then those reports from your other healthcare providers so that we know what's going on with you, your cardiologist, your endocrinologist, your eye doctor, your dentist, and your primary care provider. Again, we mentioned that the transfusion record is very important. And if you keep a list of your outside labs, that's very beneficial for us to see how your labs change over time if they're not just drawn at the facility where you're seeing. And you want to leave with a clear understanding of the plan for treating your NDS or, or monitoring your NDS if you're not needing treatment. You wanna know when your follow-up appointments are, if there's specific instructions for new or existing medicines, if, the, if you are asking for referrals to other providers, like what time frame do you expect them to contact you so that you can follow up with them if something goes wrong, which we know it does go, sometimes things go wrong. And you wanna listen carefully for the do's and don'ts or what the recommend, recommendations are for doing and not doing. Uh, I always think you're an adult and you can make your de own decisions, but I need to tell you what, what I recommend and why, and then you can make your decision as to whether you uh, follow that recommendation or not. And then you want to keep, uh, a record or a, a phone numbers of what to report or when to report to where and at what times they're open so that you know if you need to have a backup plan, who to call and where to go. And for us, we have someone on call 24 seven, but I know not everyone has that luxury. So you don't wanna wait until you're in a crisis situation um, to have to figure that out because that increases your stress and can lead to uh, unnecessary you know, strain and, and a lot of grief, I think. And so there's this MDS Patient Outreach and Advocacy Program. In, many of you may know Audrey Hassan. Uh, she's our patient liaison. We all love, our, I love Audrey and I thank her for everything that she does for our patients and caregivers. And you can see her number here, 1-800-637-0839, extension 210. And you can also email Audrey A. Hassan at mds slash foundation.org. So I hope that this has been helpful for you. And uh, please complete a survey that you can see here. And I'm very happy to share this time with you. And I can take um, your questions now.